Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the State Government Finance and Elections Committee for March 25th, 2022. I'll call this meeting to order. And pursuant to House Rule 10.01, this meeting is being held virtually. Um, first order of business is the attendance. Uh, Mr. Brinks, take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Present. Nelson is present. Vice Chair Carlson. Carlson present. Carlson is present. Representative Nash. Present. Nash is present. Representative Bonner. Representative Juskowski. Present. Juskowski is present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Elkins is present. Representative Greenman. Present. Greenman is present. Representative Cleborne. Cleborne present. Cleborne is present. Representative Kosnick. Present. Kosnick is present. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason is present. Representative New Brindley is excused. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski present. Pulowski is present. Representative Quam. I see Representative Bonner just joined us. Representative Bonner. Chair, with that, we have a quorum. Quorum is present. Um, so the next order of business is the approval of the minutes from yesterday's meeting. Um, Representative Carlson, did you get a chance to look at the minutes? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the minutes from March 24th. Uh, Representative Carlson moved approval of the minutes from March 24th, 2022. Uh, everybody want to unmute. All in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, and I think I heard Representative Quam uh, there. So. <laughs> Anyway, the first uh, bill on the day is House File 4221, and I'll hand the, um, the gavel over to Representative Carlson, Vice Chair Carlson, um, as that's House File 4221 is my bill. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, would you like to move your bill, House File 4221? Um, I think first we need to move. Oh, we I'll have move the division, division report. report. Yep. Right. I'll move right, the division right. report. Any comments, questions on the division report? Okay, uh, Chair Nelson, you want to move? You're moving adoption of the division report, then. I move adoption of the division report. Yes. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Uh, the division report is adopted. Uh, so to your bill, Chair Nelson. Also, I'll move, I'll move House File 4221 to be referred to the General Register. Wonderful and. No amendments on this bill, correct? Correct. Okay, great. So Chair Nelson moves House File 4221 uh, to the General Register. Chair, uh, Chair Nelson, to your bill. Um, members, Chair, Mr. Chair, this is a fairly simple bill. Um, currently in statute, every county, 86 counties in the state are allowed to give a per diem to people that serve on boards and commissions in their county with the exception of Hennepin County. Hennepin County is asked to be allowed to do this because they want to increase and diversify the number of people that are that serve on these boards to get a better sense from the, from the general public of uh, on these boards. So with that, Mr. Chair, I have a testifier here, Ms. Uh, Angela Connolly from the uh, Hennepin County that, to explain. Wonderful. Commissioner Conley, welcome to the committee. If you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, my name is Angela Conley, Hennepin County Commissioner, and I'll start with a little bit of background. So in 1967, the legislature enacted Minnesota statute section 375.47, and that allowed counties throughout Minnesota to set a reasonable allowance for expenses or per diem for persons serving on, serving on county advisory boards. However, that 1967 law exempted counties containing a city of the first class from paying allowances, and that meant that Hennepin County, Ramsey County, and St. Louis County were prohibited from paying allowances. In 1978, Ramsey County was exempted from this exception, and in 2000, St. Louis County received an exemption from this exception, thereby 
leaving Hennepin County as the only county in the state that cannot pay allowances or a per diem for citizens who serve on advisory boards or commissions. So um, House File 4221 seeks to remove this exception for Hennepin County, thereby allowing Hennepin County, like all other 86 counties in the state, to by resolution set reasonable allowances or a per diem allowance to be paid to members of boards or agencies authorized by statute. Hennepin County has a relatively small number of boards and advisory commissions where citizens serve without any remuneration. Um, and Hennepin County has found that this prohibition in state law acts as a barrier to its recruitment of a number of people whose time and talents could advise the county on really important issues. Um, so Hennepin County has exemptions in other sections of law that allow us to compensate people on some of our other boards, such as the library board, the HR board, and the capital budgeting task force, and other bodies like the Three Rivers Park District <laughs> and the Minneapolis Planning <laughs> Commission, and the Adult Mental Health Local Advisory Council, which I used to serve on prior to my election to the board, these are all allowed a stipend through other statutes. So there are just a few boards uh, like the Race Equity Advisory Council and Extension Offices, the Workforce Innovation, and a handful of others that we just can't reimburse for their time. So, um, you know, the rationale for the 1967 law has long since passed. All other 86 counties are allowed to compensate members of advisory boards and commissions, and Hennepin County should be able to do the same. So I appreciate the opportunity to testify you uh, testify before you this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate your testimony this morning. Uh, I have no other testifiers listed. Uh, member questions. Member questions for Commissioner Commissioner Connolly or the bill author. Give folks just a second here. Okay, seeing none. Uh, Chair Nelson, closing comments uh, to your bill. Mr. Chair, members, um, as I said, this is this is a matter of equity. This is a matter of, of getting uh, more people to be able to participate in these things. And so it's a, it's a good bill and it's a simple bill. And if, if the original 67 law was in place, Olmstead County now being with Rochester, now being a city of the first class would also no longer be able to do this. So. It's, like I said, it's a matter of equity for the for Hennepin County. So I, I urge a yes vote. Okay. With that, Chair Nelson renews his motion to refer House File 4221 to the General Register. Uh, Mr. Brinks, will you please take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Uh, Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Dreskowski. No. Dreskowski votes nay. Representative Elkins. Elkins aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn aye. <clears throat> Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley is excused. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. Aye. Quam votes aye. Chair with a vote of 11 ayes, one nay, one excused. The motion prevails. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brinks. With that, the motion does prevail and is on its way to the general register. Uh, Chair Nelson, I see you've got the next bill on the agenda as well. House file 3542. Is that the bill you want to hear next? Uh, yes. Why don't we do that and, and uh, then we can move on. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, house house file. Fi <clears throat> I'll move House file 3542 be referred to the Ways and Means Committee. Okay. Chair Nelson moves House file 3542 to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this one does have the author's amendment. So I would imagine we want to start with that first, right, Mr. Chair? And Mr. Chair and members, when we've heard this bill earlier and the uh, MMB, there were some questions oh, about- uh, Chair Nelson, can we move the amendment first then? Uh, well, I just want to, I just want to, okay. I'll move the A2 amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. And members, when we, 
when we heard this bill earlier, there was some questions with MMB about whether the way that the bill was structured, the section one of the bill um, would cause some problems with federal regulations, arbitrage issues. And so after meeting with the, with the Senate, Senate author and with, the, with this MMB, we've came up, come up with this amendment to, to change, um, to delete the section one and replace it with the amendment and what basically it does is the problem was by creating an account, a separate account, and saying that it has to that money has to be used to pay out the bonds, um, that created some of these issues with federal regulations. And so what we're doing is we're is softening that a little bit, requiring this, the MMB to look at this every year and and use that excess money that's in the stadium reserve to pay out the bonds, which is what the Electronic pull tabs were set up to do in the first place was to pay the bonds off, um, and and the, by with the excess money they're using that we can pay those bonds off. And once the, bond, the the bonds are paid off, the stadium is debt is cleared. That money can then be freed up to use for any other item in the general fund that they, that they want to use that money for. So that's what the amendment does, Mr. Mr. Chair and members. Excellent. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Questions to the A two amendment. Member questions to the A2 amendment. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of the A2 amendment, uh, members, please unmute yourselves. All those in favor of the A2 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Chair Nelson, uh, any more comments to the bill now that's in the form that you uh, would prefer, or should we move to testifiers? Uh, we can move to testifiers. Excellent, let's do that. First on the list, I have Jen Hassamer. Uh, Jen, if you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Carlson, and thank you, Chair Nelson, for um, introducing this A2 amendment. For the record, I'm Jen Hassamer, Assistant Commissioner at Minnesota Management and Budget. Primarily, I just wanted to thank Chair Nelson for um, being open to the conversation around the very technical issues involving federal arbitrage regulations that apply to the state's tax-exempt debt. Um, it's not a conversation we often find ourselves in, um, but appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation about it and an openness to this A2 amendment that would um, relieve some of the restrictions that would have been imposed by a uh, segregation and restriction of the stadium reserve funds for the prepayment of debt. Um, happy to um, answer any other questions on the amendment and appreciate the support for it today. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ms. Hassamer. Uh, my second testifier I have listed here is Mr. David Johnson. David, if you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Dave Johnson. Uh, I'm a partner at Fagri uh, Drinker, uh, and I represent uh, the Minnesota Vikings. I'm primarily here to answer any technical questions, so I don't really have any prepared question, uh, uh, testimony, but just here to assist uh, uh, Chair Nelson in, any question, in questions of a technical nature. But thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify. All right, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for being here. Uh, member questions, members, questions, comments. Okay. Seeing none, Chair Nelson, back to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And again, as we, as we discussed earlier when we had this bill in front of us, the idea is to get the stadium paid off. Um, we have the, the money in the certain that that's building in the stadium reserve that uh, above and beyond what's needed currently to pay the, to pay the, the yearly uh, debt service. But by paying it off early, we're going to save the state more than $59 million in interest. Um, and that's that's the, the goal behind doing this is by just like just like a person that has a home mortgage, if they come in on a, a chunk of money and they can afford to pay their mortgage off, it's they save a lot of money on their on their interest. We're trying to do that here for the state. Once that the stadium is paid off, that uh, those electronic pull tab dollars that are needed for that are were set up to, to pay the stadium debt off are free. That money is free to go to any other purpose that the state needs it. And so that's, again, that's the purpose behind this bill. 
Chair Nelson, since uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, do you want to lead us in the uh, Vikings fight song? <laughs> no? no. Okay. All right. Uh, one last chance for member questions to uh, House File 3542. Again, seeing none. So with that, Chair Nelson renews his motion to refer House File 3542 as amended to the Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Brinks, would you please take the roll? Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. Aye. Nash votes aye. Representative Bonner. Aye. Bonner votes aye. Representative Drozkowski. Aye. Drozkowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. Aye. Kosnick votes aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley is excused. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam. Aye. Quam votes aye. Chair, with a vote of 12 ayes and one excuse, the motion prevails. The motion does prevail and is adopted. Uh, once again, I'll just restate. Well, it looks like that's already gone. Uh, the, the motion is ad uh, adopted. Next, uh, oh, it's my bill. So I'm gonna hand this back over to uh, Chair Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, the next bill on our agenda is House File 4248, uh, Representative Carlson. Um, and my understanding is we're gonna lay this over for possible inclusion. So Representative Carlson. Thank you, Chair Nelson. And if we could also, um, I'd also like to move the uh, A1 amendments to get it into um, the format that I would prefer. Uh, Representative Carlson moves the A1 amendment. Um, you need to explain or is it just as a clarifying amendment? It, it is, it's a clarifying author's amendment. It adds uh, the word television, I believe. So uh, other than that, uh, that would get it in the form that I would prefer. Thank you, Representative Carlson. With that, members, if you want to unmute, Representative Carlson is moving the A1 amendment to put it in the shape he needs. Um, all fa in favor of the A1 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Representative Carlson, um, explain your bill. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Members, House File 42. 48 would provide funding for Minnesota public television stations through block grants. Um, through this committee, the legislature has funded public television matching and small equipment grants over the years, but those grants have not increased since 2013, so almost 10 years. Uh, this bill would authorize a one-time appropriation for block grants to help stations catch up, Block grants were established in statute more than 40 years ago, but have uh, not been funded for some time. During an economic downturn years ago, block grant funding was dropped while matching and small equipment grants remained. The language in statute for block grants requires that all the stations in Minnesota receive the same block grant amount. This is based on the idea that stations in rural communities and urban areas all have the same, uh, same needs for services, ranging from maintenance to outreach to staffing. So with that members, uh, that's my opening comments. I'd like at this time to turn it over to uh, my testifier, uh, Mr. Les Heen uh, from Minnesota Public Television Association to provide uh, some additional commentary. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Heen. If you wanna state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Carlson. For the record, my name is Les Heen, and I represent the Minnesota Public Television Association today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, in public television, we often like to say, welcome to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, so I'll toss that greeting out as well, because uh, roughly one-third of our main channel schedule every day is uh, children's programming, and we reach more than 90% of Minnesota households. So we like to think we're all uh, welcoming people to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> the Public Television Association is a group of six independent uh, nonprofit stations that operate across the state of Minnesota. And that's different from what happens in many other states uh, where there's maybe one big operation that is a state agency or quasi-state agency. But in all of our stations across the state, we 
provide local programming and national programming, and see the local needs and outreach. As Representative Carlson mentioned, what we have before you today in House File 4248 is uh, a catch up. It's an opportunity for stations to catch up because it has been, as Representative Carlson mentioned, um, several years since we had an increase in the what's called the operating or matching grants. And this approach for block grants was put in place many years ago because every station operates transmitters, every station operates studio to transmitter links, every station uh, operates and has uh, towers to maintain and some basic staffing needs. So this provides an opportunity for stations to catch up. Um, in equipment, for example, there are things that's, that are common to all stations where we need to catch up and things that are not necessarily, um, you know, taken care of, uh, you know, uh, you know in the way that we would necessarily like. For example, there are expenses with such things as maintaining studio to transmitter links and microwaves. And also something that a lot of people wouldn't think about, such as tower painting, because if you have a tower that is several hundred feet tall, it takes a lot of expense uh, simply to maintain those towers and those towers in many cases have to be painted in certain patterns to comply with federal law. So those are some of the needs that we have across the state. Um, we also have needs um, in, in really, it's really, it's three areas. It's the technology or equipment is one, education is another, and the third one is uh, human resources. In technology or equipment, the stations have to have um, software and maintain in many cases now, uh, software or service agreements for equipment that um, in years ago, you could take it apart and work on it. And now uh, the, the equipment has to be maintained through uh, maintenance agreements. Um, there are also in the area of education, we have stations that are finding greater need for education services, including connecting more with schools and streaming. And we have stations that are working on education initiatives. So that would be important to them as well. A third important area that we have um, is just the human resources. As we all know, we need people to make things work and we have to have good staff throughout the state to staff in initiatives such as education and with more technology needs all the time, uh, uh, staff salaries and engineering as well. So uh, in the interest of time, I wanted to keep this to a couple of minutes here, but that outlines the fact that this is a catch up uh, for stations after having had these grants be uh, flat for quite a few years. So we appreciate the uh, interest and appreciate the, the work that uh, we've seen done on this over the years. And with that, I wanna thank you. And again, urge support of House File 4248. Thank you. Questions, members. Questions of the of, of the bill. I'll ask one more time. Questions, seeing no hands jumping up. Um, Representative Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, I would ask for your support. With that, members, um, we'll lay this bill over as amended. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlson. And the last bill we have today is House File 3285, Representative Stansteed. Um, welcome to the committee. And uh, um, uh, I see we have a division report. Uh, Representative Mason, do you want to move the division report? You're, 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 yeah, there you go. Oh, I'm sorry. I moved the report. Division reports in front of us, and any questions, members of the division report? If not, everybody on want to unmute. All in favor of adopting the division report for 3285, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The ayes have it. Um, I'll move House File 3285 to be referred to the General Register. Representative Sandsteed, uh, present your bill. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present House File 3285. Um, this file is a bill that will allow counties to advertise, sell, lease, or convey county-owned property on a county website and allow them to solicit and accept bids through the online auction process. This is a bill that I've developed along with St. Louis County to bring the process into the 21st century. Again, I just wanna articulate that this is only for county owned property. It doesn't apply to tax forfeited property. The bill also requires counties to advertise bids or proposal on the county website in, additional, in addition to the traditional notices in the newspaper. Additionally, the bill clarifies the proposals 
or I'm sorry, it, in addition to leases less than 15,000 for any single year can be negotiated and aren't subject to the competitive bid process under this law. Mr. Chair, it's 2022 and we're all conducting business online, even the government. Um, and St. Louis County, a county that has conducted other sales online, including tax forfeited property auctions, um, just found this to be extremely beneficial in raising revenue for the county. Um, it certainly makes it far more convenient for both the people trying to participate in the process and for the county. They don't have to, uh, individuals participating in the process don't have to take time off of work to attend an in-person auction. I do have with me today one testifier, St. Louis County Lands Director, Julie Marinucci, and I'd turn it over to her at this time. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Marinucci. Uh, if you want to state your name for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Nelson, committee members. My name is Julie Marinucci. I'm the land commissioner for St. Louis County. And I really don't have a whole lot to add. Representative Sansa did a great job setting it up. I, I just want to reiterate the fact that, you know, with our land sale program broadly, we have seen significant benefits to be able to leverage online platforms. And, and this, this bill would allow us to extend that same benefit to the county fee-owned lands for the direct benefit of those in St. Louis County when we move those properties back to private ownership. Um, and I, I would stand for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Marinucci. Um, I see we have a question, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the author, is the so I, I know that you're notifying in the newspaper and this is a completely online auction correct miss miss sandstead represent sandstead thank you mr chair this is advertising in the newspaper and giving the ability to advertise <clears throat> online correct representative nash and mr chair and representative sandstead the sale is also conducted online correct representative mr chair sandstead. That is correct. Stance, yeah. okay. And Mr. Chair, um, oh, I feel guilty as a technology guy to say this, but I, I am concerned that we are moving away from an in-person auction because two things. One, not everybody has great coverage as evidenced by the fact that I often am unable to be on video, much to the consternation of some on this committee. Uh, but also, we've got people who would be interested in purchasing county-owned land that may have uh, farms or other properties adjacent to these county-owned lands that are Luddites. They don't like technology, they, or they are really bad at technology, and they may not be able to understand how to bid on something. So I think that's problematic, and it causes me tremendous pause. And additionally, I, I, I don't find attending an in-person auction to be that onerous if you're truly interested in that property. So let's say I live here in Carver County and there is Carver County owned property and I really wanted it. Uh, I should be able to find uh, the gumption to get up and hop in the vehicle and get down there to the place and, and bid on this. So I appreciate this, I do, but I, I have a problem with the actual execution of the, the auction being online only. I'm completely fine with it, with notification being a hybridized of both online and in a newspaper, but the auction being only online, I, I do have a problem with it. And as a result, I'd be voting no on the bill. Thank you, Representative Lash. Um, any further questions or comments? Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Along the same lines, uh, um, I've noticed a lot of outside Minnesota entities buying up, you know, different properties and that. Um, and I don't want to be, um, you know, biased, but I am biased that, uh, you know, local people should have you know the best access and you know frankly showing up and doing a bid 
um, I think is showing that they actually would come to the state, would, would be in the, uh, in the area, and just not do it as a uh, unconnected uh, investment. Because I think especially public, uh, you know, lands being sold by the public entities, um, that's a, that should have a lot of local connectivity. And I, I agree with the issues brought up by Representative Nash that uh, the, the people around that area um, should be able to show up and, uh, and participate in that auction. Thank you. Thank you for that, Representative Quam. Any further questions or comments? Mr. Chair? If not, Representative Sandston, if you want to wrap up and answer, well, I'd maybe like to, answer. I'd like to respond to those two comments, both to Representative Nash and Representative Quam. I think um, I, I understand what you're saying and I do hear your point. However, um, it's somewhat of a presumption that people who would purchase online might not show up and might not be involved or or be good stewards of that purchase. And that's that's just a presumption. That's not um, any kind of a guarantee. And we have seen great success in the, the tax forfeited properties with the county. And quite honestly, for as many that may want to show up in person, there's equally as many people pushing back and saying they prefer this online process. So, I think it's just, again, this is more of a modernization bill to bring what the county is able to do into this 21st century. And I appreciate those comments. Um, it's gonna work for some and it's not gonna be as palatable for others. And, and I, I wish there was a better answer for that, but I do think that the process itself um, is beneficial to the counties and to the majority of people wanting to take part in that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I did Miss Marinucci, it was, you had your hand to look up, or did you want to comment? Uh, th thank you, Chair Nelson. Uh, I would only add that, you know, St. Louis County has, has used online auction platform for our tax forfeited land sales. Recently, the DNR has actually moved to an online auction platform for selling some of their surplus lands. And they had also incredible success. And as it relates to um, as it relates to active participate participants in our auctions, historically, when you had to show up in person, we would watch families having to bring their kids to the auctions, take full days off of work to be able. So there's equal issues with access as it relates to being able to participate. The other thing to note when we do the online auction, it isn't a one-time stop. It allows people over the course of usually two weeks to be able to participate in the auction, to be able to watch and see what's going on and engage and find that way for access if they are struggling. So there is multiple ways to engage. That would be my only addition. Thank you, Ms. Marinucci. Uh, Representative Skowski, you put your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Quam's question uh, sparked some thoughts that I had. and. Uh, I'd be interested, maybe the, the testifier, Ms. Farinucci or Marinucci, I didn't quite catch it. Marinucci. Um, Marinucci, thank you. Um, I wonder what what ability do foreign governments have to buy land? And uh, would this uh, make it easier for China and other foreign countries to buy Minnesota land? Or God forbid, Canada. Rep Ms. Marinucci. Uh, thank you, Chair Nelson. Um, as part of the, the process, uh, the, the auctions are open. I, I don't know that I can specifically, I know historically we've sold a lot of property on the, the tax forfeited side online and have not had any sort of foreign activity, but I cannot speak to the specific platform that we use as to the protections in place that would allow us to reject a bidder. We do check everyone who is bidding as it relates. And again, I don't wanna confuse the issue, but my experience is with tax forfeited land and there's certain criteria for them to be eligible bidders and they have to be current on their taxes in Minnesota. So we do have the ability to screen uh, bidders to make sure that they are eligible per the statute in place 
in the tax forfeited realm. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Marinucci. So, uh, Ms. Marinucci, if a foreign government bid on, or a foreign buyer of any sort, I should say, bid on uh, a piece of land in St. Louis County through this online auction, would they be able to purchase it online? Ms. Marinucci. Uh, thank you, Chair. At this point, I am not aware of any prohibit any way that we would be able to prohibit that type of bidding and that would be something that I think that we would probably leave to our uh, county board for guidance on as to whether or not they would be looking for that type of uh, prohibited bidders. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you Mr. Chair. So Ms. Marinucci, so tell us about that process. Does the county board then review the online bidding winner and, um, and, and decide to accept or reject the sale um, after they have full discovery of who that bidder is? Ms. Marinucci. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, it, it wouldn't be on a per bidder basis. So if this legislation moves forward and in the transition of the management of county fee land within St. Louis County, our plan would be to bring more of a workflow and a process to our county board for consideration so that they can see the transition of our historic management of county fee land and what that would look like going forward as we enter into transitioning this to online auction. That is the process we followed with the tax forfeited transition for that land sale program and we would plan to follow that same process. So it would be laying out kind of the criteria, not specific bidders. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Marinucci. Um, uh, I, um, I, well, uh, Representative St Sanstey, thank you for the bill. Um, I, I like the idea of making it more accessible to people. Um, I do have some concerns that I think have been outlined in the, in the testimony uh, just recently. Um, I'm wondering if, if this bill could have some of those kind of back end uh, or process pieces built into it that Ms. Marinucci uh, referred to that could be built in counties. Uh, I'm, I have worries about um, foreign governments and, and maybe foreign buyers uh, buying land in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Representative Drzkowski. Mr. Chair. Representative, um, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rep Representative Drzkowski, I am more than happy to have a conversation with you to talk about um, what we could do to quell your concerns on this. Should this move to the floor, this is possible, something possible that we could add an amendment to. Um, I would just urge a conversation offline to see how we could improve this and, and uh, tighten it up a little bit. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Sanstead, I, um, I've sold a number of larger items that um, at auction. And in the room, there was both a live auctioneer and then an online presence uh, where people were effectively being bidders agents. Is that something that you would entertain, which would allow both an in-person bidder and a a an online hybridized bidder i'm just trying to I, I i like the idea of going online obviously being a technology that's something i would advocate for but also recognize that the voice of somebody who lives locally that may as i pointed out earlier have have an aversion to technology or may not have the bandwidth to, to do that is that something that you would entertain amending into your bill representative sandstead Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Nash, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, in practical applications, I, I don't know how that impacts the county or, or what that would um, do to the process. So I think uh, we should maybe have a, a collective conversation to see if that's something that could be worked out uh, up front. I, I'm not opposed to that idea. So again, something that we probably should continue to have a conversation on, feel free, and, and we'll keep this conversation going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And well, perhaps Mr. Marinucci from the county would be able to outline their ability to do such a, a an auction where you could host online bids, but also allow somebody to be present to also bid. 
And again, this is, I'll lay out a scenario that causes me the most pause. So we'll, we'll say that the Smith family lives in a certain county and uh, the county acquired this piece of land ostensibly using county taxpayer dollars. I think that we would, rec we would agree that that's the likely scenario of how that land was purchased. Now the county is going to put this up for sale, but the Smiths don't have particularly good internet access, but they'd still like to buy the property. So their, their tax dollars went into purchasing it. They are precluded from now possibly acquiring it because of uh, a dearth of technology uh, access they may have. Isn't that something that the county is concerned about, Ms. Marinucci? Ms. Marinucci. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I would I would comment the the question about what, being able to have someone, let's call it proxy, bid for you. That that um, ability is there. So you a person could work with someone else that has got better connectivity to lay out their ability to bid on the auction. Um, at this point, we have not explored the ability to do a, a part live, part um, virtual bidding scenario because of the, the platform that we use and have used to date. We have it over an extended period of time. We have it over a two week period and we do see bidding throughout that full two weeks. So at this point, we have not explored that, and I'm not sure how the logistics would work to be able to accommodate a part live, part virtual uh, bidding environment. Ms. Miranucci, in the, in the two-week time period or, or whatever time period you have the bids open, would somebody be able to walk in and deliver a bid in person to the county as opposed to having to do it online? Chair, thank you. Uh, that that was a, a big concern we had originally was again this access to technology and the ability to bid. And we, we as looking at history, we have not had any issues or complaints or or problems where people came in and saying, I wanted it, I wasn't able to bid, I didn't have access. If there was someone who at because we advertise these well in advance of when the auction goes live, if someone identified a piece of property they were very interested in, we can work with them to make sure they've got access and we could even, you know, whether it be pointing them to a library, walking them through a, a kiosk at one of our facilities to try and help them make sure that they've got the ability. You can also, as part of the bidding process, set your upper limit. So you don't have to be there hitting bid every single time. It's very similar to other online bidding platforms. So you can set up your highest bid and then it will incrementally um, increase the bid over time until it reaches that max. Um, did, did that answer your question, Chair? I think that answered my question. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I appreciate your suggestion and your prompting there. So I, I, I personally sell many things on a well-known online auction site. I do it every day. And I certainly believe in technology, but I also understand from serving a county that itself has a large number of rural people who I know well and know them to be utter and complete Luddites. And, and I, I love my people and I, I think that they would probably enjoy the opportunity to both be in person at an auction to purchase a piece of land that might benefit them that their tax dollars went into acquiring. So, uh, you know, Representative Sanson, you, you said we'll have a discussion. I'm, I'm looking, in order to gain a positive vote, I'm looking for more than just have a discussion. I'm trying to figure out, is there a way that people can make their upper limit online bids online, but also at, the, at a certain prescribed time, have the online bids tabulated and have a, 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 a hybridized live auction and in-person live auction to, to button this all up. Uh, Sotheby's does this, other places do this. It is not incredibly difficult to do this. And I think if you're going to make an accommodation for people who live in whatever county that this may be, uh, their tax dollars went into this piece of land to purchase it initially for the county. Why would we not bend over backwards to make sure that they have a venue of some sort or another to be able to bid on these things. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. 
Again, Representative Nash, we just heard that we have not had a single complaint, a single, not once, through this process, which is being used um, effectively in different locations. Have we had a concern or a complaint that somebody felt they didn't really have access to this? Um, again, I, I don't have a different answer for you other than I'm willing to look at this. Um, I. I am not the person sitting behind the desk conducting these auctions. I rely on my county. Uh, we have heard the testimony that it has been very effective. It has worked very effectively, and there have been no complaints. Um, given that history, the purpose of this bill is to move forward and to make it successful in other areas. The, by, by all accounts so far, it has been successful. So that's the purpose of this. Um, I understand that for you, you may want to do this in person. Um, I don't. I don't know that um, there's. If somebody is very interested in a piece of property, that if if they were really sincere about it, that they wouldn't find a way to a location that had the connectivity that they would need um, to do this if that was their interest. If if they are willing to drive somewhere or attend an auction in person, then I would imagine they would make the same effort to get to a location that had the connectivity they needed to participate in the auction. Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just be brief. Um, we don't create legislation for situations that are only ideal. We, we try to make legislation that is thoughtful and is accommodative for uh, all scenarios. So uh, as a result of that, I'll be voting no. Representative Quam. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And when I look at technology, it should augment and when it does surplant, um, it increases the divide and the disenfranchised people that don't have the access, the familiarity, et cetera. And my concern is this bill is allowing the surplantation and increasing the disenfranchisement and the disparities uh, amongst different members of the community. And I think that we need to uh, be sure not to, uh, you know, discriminate by actions we take. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Quam. Seeing no further hands, Representative Sandstead, uh, wrap up your bill and we'll get it to a vote. Sounds good, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, again, this bill is really a modernization bill. It has come out of uh, the experience of moving these sales online with great success, with favorability from the people participating in those events. I do appreciate uh, the very robust discussion that we have had on this bill. I think that uh, there's definitely room for a conversation on this. And again, I'd be happy to to work at improving some of those things, especially Representative Draskowski. Um, I'm, I'm willing to look at that with you and uh, we can move forward on this. And I appreciate the conversation. It's not to supplant, it's really a modernization and, and the way we conduct business as time goes on does change. And we've seen that historically in all realms. And this is just one other area that it seems like we are moving towards. So I think it's a good bill and I would appreciate your support on it. With that members, I'll renew my motion that house file 3285 be referred to the general register. Mr. Brinks, please take the roll. Thank you. Chair Nelson. Aye. Nelson votes aye. Vice Chair Carlson. Aye. Carlson votes aye. Representative Nash. No. Nash votes nay. Representative Bonner. Representative Draskowski. Aye. Draskowski votes aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins votes aye. Representative Greenman. Aye. Greenman, <coughs> Greenman votes aye. Representative Cleborn. Cleborn, aye. Cleborn votes aye. Representative Kosnick. No. Kosnick votes nay. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. 
Mason votes aye. Representative New Brindley is excused. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski votes aye. Representative Quam? No. Quam votes nay. Representative Bonner? Aye. Bonner votes aye. I apologize, Representative Jeskowski, your audio cut out a little bit. I just want to confirm your vote of an aye. That is correct. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, chair with a vote of nine ayes, three nays, and one excuse, the motion prevails. The motion prevails. The bill's on its way to the general register. Thank you, Representative Sandstead, and thank you, Ms. Maranucci. Uh, thank you, Mr. Members, chair. With that, members, um, that's, that's all of our agenda for this morning. Our next meeting is Tuesday. Um, we have three bills on the agenda, House File 4333, House File 4568, and House File 4524. And with that, members, if there are no other questions or comments, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.